All right, good evening, everybody. We uh, are here at 6.04 uh, p.m. for our May 28, 2024 Marin Town Council uh, workshop. Um, tonight's workshop will be on the change lock uh, annexation process as well as uh, our FY23-24 mid-year budget report. Um, at this time, if everyone could please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, 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 States of America, America. and to the and Republic, to the Republic for, for which it stands, one nation, one nation God, under God, visible, visible and liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. That is harder to do than one might think um, with everybody talking. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate everybody being here, and um, I know that some residents will join as well. We're going to go ahead and start. Um, let me take a look and see. Yeah, um, I think um, unless someone uh, objects strongly, what I would like us to do is to go ahead and um, go through our presentations uh, on the on the uh, potential annexation area and the proposed annexation area. Um, get all of that information, um, then we can um, have some public input, um, and then town council can have some one-on-one -on -one discussion and, and uh, deep discussion on their uh, feelings about this particular proposed annexation area. So I will turn this over at uh, this time to uh, Robert. And uh, I hang on a second, I make sure I got everybody here. Brad, you're here as well too. I know I saw you up there. Yes, sir. And Brad as well. Brad? Thank you. Robert, you want to do any introduction or do you want me to go ahead? Uh, yeah, this is um, a property that we identified, I believe it was in 2014, as a potential annexation site when we were trying to restrict or try to negotiate a JPA, a joint planning agreement with Orange County, uh, when we were looking at the possible annexation of the northwest uh, corner of Apopka Island and Conroy Windermere. Um, when that came up, you know, there was a lot of discussion with the COE and Winter Garden and then as well as Orange County as far as, okay, where are you guys expecting to possibly annex in just so they they would understand what our growth potential would be and understanding that, again, everything that's around us is pretty much already built out. Um, so the focus of the annexation areas were the northwest corner that would go um, west down 6th and then include Chandelac um, with the possibility of going to McKinnon and then Isleworth and nothing south of that. Um, so the area that we took a look at that would um, is contiguous and makes a lot of sense because it's a gated community um, and there would be no negative financial impact to the town um, and that the uh, Chandelac HOA and some of the residents have expressed a lot of interest. Uh, we believe that this would be a win-win for both the uh, town of Windermere and also the uh, the residents of Chandelac. Um, and with that said, I'll let Brad go through the process and I'll get into the specifics as far as the cost-benefit analysis, the politics, and then Chief can add in some of the, um, the metrics when it comes to um, police protection versus Orange County protection. So Brad, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Mayor, uh, this is again Brad Cornelius with Waitrim, serving as your contracted town planner. Uh, so as the, as the council is aware, we've had a few discussions about this annexation. So I do kind of just want to give you a, a brief summary again about the process where and really where we are in the process, as well as a little bit more information on the background or about annexation. Uh, in your agenda item, you do see there's an a, annexation analysis that we did prepare. And that's one of the requirements that we have to do as part of the annexation process, not only by your own comprehensive plan that talks about we need to look at what would be the impact to the town based on an annexation, but also under Florida statute and what we have to provide to Orange County if the town does decide to move forward with this process. So I'm gonna provide a brief summary of, of what's in that analysis, at least for most of that analysis. Um, so what you see on the slide there uh, is, is the annexation area, proposed annexation area, that's Sean Dulac area. Uh, the town boundary, existing town boundary is there to the east in that green 
um, area. And then the bluish area is the Chandu du Lac area. Um, you, it is adjacent to the town. That is why we're able to consider annexation. It is contiguous to the town's boundary. Um, the Sean du Lac area that we're looking at is approximately 102 acres in size in total. It's comprised of 74 parcels. Um, that breaks down into, at the time we got this data, there is 51 single family homes there with an average parcel size at about one and a half acres. Uh, there are six resi vacant residential properties. There's 16 parcels that the HOA owns. That's either the roadway or stormwater, uh, things like that within the area. Um, there's one agricultural exempt property, and that's the breakdown of the properties that are within Sean du Lac. Um, one of the things that I do want to point out is, you know, the way this community, the Sean du Lac community is, it's very similar to the town of Windermere. In terms of the lot sizes, as you see here, you know, the average lot size is an acre or greater. Um, there are some smaller lots, I mean, about half acre in some parts of it. But by and large, the it is the same as the town in terms of that uh, size of properties and, and as well as many of the home sizes are very similar that we have throughout the town of Windermere. And, and that is, is Chandu Lock. Um, one of the things that, that I do want to talk about briefly is, and this is part of your comprehensive plan and something we'll talk about more as we move forward on your comp plan, but one of the things we look at is your build out and, and you have, you know, the town of Windermere, you're what's would be called an essentially built out community. You have very few vacant properties left in the town. And because of that, we see redevelopment. But when we look at ultimate build out um, right now, your population based on the, the most recent estimate that we have is 3,038 residents. If the rest of the city, uh, rest of the town builds out on those vacant properties, you're looking at a population of about 3,250. And that would be the full build out of the town as it is today um, without any significant other changes in the future. But that's what it would be. If we were to annex in Sean du Lac, that would bring in approximately another 212 people into that total build out, which would then bring the future total build out of the town of Windermere to 3,000. 462. Still not a very big number in terms of population and, and, and those kinds of impacts, not a significant number change in terms of, of that part of it. Um, the most important part that when we look at annexation in terms of the, the technical side of annexation is to assure that it's compliant with Florida statutes under chapter 171. And that's what the report you have um, as part of your agenda item. That's what that's looking at. And I, I will summarize it for you. Um, what we have to determine first is it meets all the prerequis prerequisites for annexation, meaning that it, it, it's contiguous. It's not a, an area that kind of is strung along a roadway to just annex in an area that we want to get it, but it, it's a defined area where clearly we meet those requirements. The other part of that analysis is looking at, is this area what the statute calls developed for urban purposes? And that definition is pretty, pretty easy to meet actually. It's basically that the lots in this area are less than five acres in size, which is the case here. Every one of them um, is less than five acres in size. So it clearly meets that test that it's developed for urban purposes. So those are the most primary prerequisites that we have to look at to make sure it's contiguous, it's developed for urban purposes, and it is not, you know, strung along just to pick something up in which we meet all those standards and requirements. The other part of the analysis that we have to look at, and I think Robert will get more into the details about this, and I'll give the high level about this, is we then have to look at, you know, how will this property be served after annexation? How will the town provide public service to this area? And at the high level, what, you know, with the Sean du Lac community, as we've discussed previously, um, the roadways in Sean du Lac are private roadways. They're behind a gate. They're maintained by the Sean du Lac HOA. 
that would not change after annexation. That would still be private roadways. The town would not take any responsibility for the maintenance of any of the roads within Sean du Lac, um, as well as the related stormwater that goes with, with that community. That would all remain private. So there would no, no change before or after annexation on how that would, how that would be provided. In terms of utilities, again, it's very similar to the town. The only utility uh, that they have there in terms of water and sewer is they do have Orange County water, does serve the Sean du Lac community. Um, as you all know, some of the town currently has Orange County water and you're in the process now of expanding that to other parts of the town. So they're, they're similar to the town in terms of the water provision. Again, that will not change. They would still be served by Orange County utilities with the water, water services. Also similar to the town, um, they are on septic. They do not have Orange County sewer there currently. Again, same as the town. Most of the town, we don't have sewer yet, but as you all know, you have authorized the sewer master plan study. So if this were to be annexed in, that could be part of that future analysis of the future expansion of sewer services with, within the town. So really there's no change in terms of the water or sewer um, annexation or, or stormwater with annexation. Um, in terms of, and I'll let, again, Robert and the chief talk more specifically here, but in terms of police and fire, again, after annexation, it would become the responsibility of the town to provide the police and fire services um, for this community um, in terms of the public, those public services. So we, we really don't see, there's really not a significant concern or issue on this annexation with the ability for the town to meet public services or difficulty to do it. Oh, the last one I, I didn't touch on, but I need to touch on is solid waste. Um, what would also happen, and this is on, under the statute, is the solid waste provider would switch to the town, but there is a provision under statute that the existing provider under the county can continue to provide services in the area for five years after annexation or until their contract expires. But I don't think this will be an issue because Waste Pro is the provider under the county and the same provider potentially under the town. So I don't anticipate that being an issue um, moving forward if this area would be annexed into the town. And um, I'm sorry, I have the cleaning people want to come in and clean my garbage can. Uh, um, so that's that's the solid waste. Um, and 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 I'll let Robert into the financials. Um, there will be what will happen generally on the financials if it does annex into the town. You know, some of the taxes and assessments that they would pay under the county would go away, like fire, this is the main one, would go away. And coming into the town, they would then pay, as well as the general county tax that everybody pays, whether you're in a town, city, or the county, um, they would also pay the, the town's tax rate, general general fund tax, as well as the town assessments. And Robert has, has the more specifics about that. But when we looked at that in terms of the analysis, what you'll see is we don't anticipate a negative impact on the town. We think that town and, and Robert's reviewed this. Um, the town can absorb these services with the additional revenues that would come in without a negative impact on the town operations um, as part of this annexation. So that's the overall, that's a summary of that analysis. In terms of the process, where we are at the moment is the first step still. And that is that we, we need to do this analysis, which we've done. And if the town council does decide to move forward with this annexation process, what we need to do with this analysis is then we need to send it to Orange County. And we have to give Orange County notice that we are pursuing annexation of this area, provide them this information. Uh, in my memo, I say they, they could object and we need to, they, they, they could object, but that doesn't mean we can't move forward if they do object, but we would work to resolve any objections if there were any. I quite honestly don't think we would get any. Um, and, and once that occurs, then we would begin the, the public noticing for the public hearings that would be required to come to the town council for you all to move forward with the actual referendum now to for the, the annexation. 
As we spoke in the past, because this is considered involuntary annexation, because you know they're not at, they're not we didn't get 100% of the residents are asking to be annexed in, and we would not I think get there. Um, we have to do a vote of the residents of Chandulak, of the voters of Chandulak, the registered voters of Chandulak. That is required by statute that you have to have them vote. As our last count, which was a year ago, but I don't think it's probably changed much. Um, there, there was 108 registered voters in Chandulak. Um, it's you know plus or minus a little bit a year later. And if we do move forward, we'll get an updated number on that. But I don't think it'll change much. Um, but you would be setting that referendum date for that to occur. The town council, you do have the option under the statute. You're not required to do, do this, but you do have the option to also bring it to a vote of the registered voters of the town of Windermere. So you, you could do that. You don't have to do that, but you can do that. If you do that, in order for the annexation to move forward or to be approved, you would need to have both the registered voters of Sean Dulac and the registered voters of Windermere, meaning those who actually vote. It's a simple majority of those who vote. They both would have to approve it. If one or the other doesn't approve it, then it doesn't get approved and the annexation can't move forward. So that's an option the council has, but you're not required to do that. Um, if the referendum passes, however you do it, then the next steps would be to finalize the annexation, which would include amending your comprehensive plan to give it a, a town future land use designation within your town that would require us to assign it a planned unit development, future land use, and then rezone it to a town designation. Again, it would have to be zone plan development per your comprehensive plan. Any areas annexed into the town have to come in that way. But that's a good thing because that what that allows us to do is develop the zoning standards and development standards for Chandulak where there may be significant differences between the town and the county that, that may be a negative impact on develop, you know, what the folks that live in Chandulak would expect in terms of what they could do after annexation. But that gives us the tool and you as town council, the ability to consider those and potentially approve those as part of that development agreement with that plan development. And once that occurs, they are fully part of the town of Windermere and are like every other resident of the town at that point. So that's my brief presentation and I'll turn it over to Robert. Thank you, Brad. And part of your analysis was trying to figure out uh, how much the financial impact would be to the residents of Shondalock, and I think the average was about fourteen hundred. Right. Yeah. If you take the difference between, they would pay a little bit less in ad valorem taxes, but they would pay a little more in assessments. The net change would roughly about fourteen hundred dollars. A Shondalock average property owner, in terms of assessed value, would pay about fourteen hundred dollars more a year than what they currently pay. And just so the uh, council is aware, Brad and I worked on a lot of annexations when I worked for Wildwood and he worked for Sumter County. So we know the ins and outs of annexation and what you can and cannot do, especially when it came to the Department of Community Affairs, which is now Department of Op or Economic Opportunity. So we, we are very well versed in this. Yes, we know we know how county and local cities fight with each other, then get along and make it work at the end. So, yes. All right. So administration issues, um, we'll get into the town responsibilities versus HOA responsibilities, uh, solid waste recycling, fire service protection, EMS, politics, additional benefits, and then financial impacts. Again, what I have pulled up here is the uh, presentation that we did with Shondalock residents. I believe we had three public meetings with them um, via Zoom. We also had individual meetings with some of the residents and also their HOA. So what the town would do is we would accept its uh, existing agreement, the uh, plat that was entered into with Orange County. So the HOA would continue to be responsible for the roads, common areas, stormwater, and lighting. Uh, and we would, you know, unlike what happened, I think, in 2011, is we would make sure that everything that we agree to is in an annexation agreement. So uh, nobody can point back and say, well, you, do, you agreed to take over the sidewalks or you agreed to take over the lighting or the roads. Uh, we would make sure that's all laid out in the uh, um, agreement. So solid waste recycling, uh, 
currently, again, we do two times a week solid waste pickup, Tuesdays and Fridays. Uh, we do recycling on Tuesdays, and we do uh, yard waste pickup once a week on Wednesdays. Um, these numbers are a little outdated here, um, but it'll show, well, it did show the um, the residents of Shondalock what the um, current rate was, what they were paying Orange County with Waste Pro, and what they would pay with the town of Windermere. Um, a lot of the residents, when we did talk to Shonda Locke, um, they were concerned about the one time a week pickup, um, because if it did fall on a holiday or something like that, then they would have to wait for a rescheduled date. And a big thing that they were really concerned about was emergency response, which I think we can get into a little bit later. But um, when they saw Ian and Irma, they saw how quickly the town of Windermere was able to go ahead and uh, clean up the uh, limb debris and get everything resolved within a short amount of time. Brad, I'm sorry, I have to mute you for a second. <laughs> how we were able to quickly take care of that. Uh, and remember when Orange County has to deal with, um, you know, natural disaster, they have to look at it countywide. Um, so I believe it took about three or four months maybe to pick up the limb debris that was in and around uh, the Shondalock area. So again, with a smaller community, uh, we're able to expedite things and get things done taken care of um, pretty quickly as opposed to as far as countywide. Fire protection EMS, you know, this is something that <clears throat> may be a point of contention with uh, Orange County. And this was brought up when we first talked about the annexation of the northwest corner of Apocalypse Island and Conroy Windermere Road uh, was the fact that we have an automatic or we have an agreement with ACOE. So ACOE uh, provides fire sur service protection and EMS uh, to the town of Windermere. So what ACOE has is an agreement with Orange County. Uh, it's called a, I'm sorry, um, ACOE has an agreement with us and they have an automatic aid agreement with Orange County. Um, and that's different from a mutual aid agreement. A mutual aid agreement is pretty much you know, if if there's a huge fire, um, then everybody, all hands on deck, they can go to that fire and go ahead and take care of it. An automatic aid agreement is different because it's you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Because in North Ocoee, there are less or there's more um, uh, fire stations than they are in South Ocoee. So in South Ocoee, Orange County responds to those um, um EMS calls and to um, fire department calls because they have more stations in the south, which includes Windermere, but to the north, ACOE provides that same service to Orange County because Orange County doesn't have that many fire stations to the north of ACOE. Um, so, you know, one of the things that they were scared of, Orange County, I would say, is that we would be looking at annexing in Isleworth, and that's a huge hit not only to their uh, Orange County Fire Department, but it's also a huge hit to their uh, sheriff's office. Um, so, of course, they want to keep that money and make sure that, um, you know, it's not going to be a huge financial hit to them. Uh, so when we did bring that to their attention, you know, they said they would object based on fire EMS. Um, but again, you know, there's a new sheriff in town, I would say, um, and also when we talk to a Coey, uh, Coey says they can, you know, it's, it's such a small area that it really wouldn't be, um, any real addition to them providing that fire service protection or EMS. So again, the assessment that's currently calcul calculated at 0.8 mils, um, but based on the values that they have, uh, we could potentially lower the millage rate for the entire town to 0.7 because, again, that that fire service agreement that we have with the COE only goes up by $50,000 a year. And again, I address the uh, Orange County um, automatic aid agreement, agreement. So with politics, against one is annex into the town, um, the residents of Shonda Lock would be able to vote in the town of Windermere elections. Uh, this will provide a, a more of a local say in what directly impacts them. Um, so after year residency, then they would have the eligibility to run for Windermere elections. Um, they will continue to have um, the same electoral rights that they had when they were Orange County residents. So they'll still be able to vote for Orange County mayor, 
um, Board of County Commissioners, the Sheriff, Tax Collector, all of them. Um, one of the benefits to Shonda Lock too, as far as, you know, having uh, annexing to the town of Windermere is that they have a lot of direct access to local leaders that make local decisions and also a lot of direct access, which I think all of you know, um, to town management, public works, and to the chief of police. So some of the added benefits that they would have is that they would be allowed to have access to the boat ramps on Fernwood and Bessie. Um, they would have access to the Main Street and Windermere Recreation Center. Uh, they would also be able to attend those yearly events for just residents only, and they would receive the discounts to town halls, and they can sit on various town boards and committees. Um, and again, as I discussed before, when it came to uh, disaster recovery, that was one of the big uh, points as far as they saw as a benefit was annexing to the town was that we were able to respond more quickly. And also with the trash pickup, they wanted two times a week as opposed to just that one time a week, um, you know, because again, if you cook fish on a Tuesday, then it's or Wednesday, then it's sitting uh, pretty much all week in your trash can until uh, the next pickup date. And they just saw the more of a benefit um, to having that two ice a week pickup. Financial impact. Um, the cost difference is actually going to be about 1,400 a year when you look at the um, the overall net average for everybody. Um, again, this was updated to, to reflect that number, um, but this is again, the old number is 375, but it's actually gonna be about $1,400. And when we do the uh, public information workshops with um, the Shondalock residents, you know, um, just to update them, let them know what the process is and where we're on the process, um, we'll be able to give them that number. So, before I get to questions, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to um, Chief Ogden and he can give a quick update on the benefits of having uh, the town of Windermere versus um, Orange County Sheriff's Office relative to uh, police protection and public safety. Thanks, Robert. Uh, overall from the police department, it would be de minimis on our impact at the uh, uh, Windermere Police Department. When I reviewed the statistical data, uh, we'll update that once more. They only had 26 calls per service the entire year of 2022. Once again, I'll update 2023 should we decide to move forward. Out of those 26 calls for service, the far majority of those calls were just uh, nothing but what we call alarm calls. So the majority of those, 80 to 90% of those were called off. Uh, there was one emergency call for service and that ended up being an accident right at the front of Shandal Lock. Uh, that came into the sheriff's office. They ultimately never even responded and the Florida Highway Patrol responded to that. So we see very little impact as far as we do not need to bring on additional officers, additional equipment or anything of that. We can pretty much assimilate that in our regular patrol services. Uh, some of the big additional things, obviously, is our community policing efforts that we have, getting to know the residents. But more importantly, just like some of the um, elected officials found out just two weeks ago once more, um, is that our officers carry the AEDs and we deploy the AED on a traffic um, situation where an individual um, shopped him with the AED and brought him back to life and actually uh, just got an update yesterday. He is doing fine. We have done that about three or four times in the last four or five years. I don't think you can put a financial cost on that. Um, we respond to medical calls. Matter of fact, we usually beat the fire department, any fire department there quite um by a by significant amount of time because our officers are in the town. So if there's any questions, uh, just let me know. Hey, Chief, just, could you? I'm sorry. Just, uh, I'm sorry to, uh, I didn't mean to jump in, but Chief, could you provide some of the pluses for the police department in terms of having a little larger area to serve um, some of the upside for, you know, for us other than just for the residents of Chum Luck? Yeah, sure. You know, anytime we have some new area, that's a new area for officers to patrol and get to know the folks. You know, we uh, we, we have a pretty small town, a pretty small footprint. It's like 1.9 square miles. And and you can imagine for 12 hours a day, if you drive around that, um, you're going to get a little bit a little bit bored there. So it's nice to meet some new folks. You know, a lot of the folks in Chandelock, I know, uh, we know they show up to the uh, food truck events and things like that. So I kind of feel like they're a part of the town anyway, as far as the community policing effort. So I think that would be uh, great for the officers just to kind of expand that um, that area just a little bit, that footprint. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. One of the financial benefits for the town of Windermere would be a 
not only an ad valorem uh, revenue, but also with the ancillary um, tax revenues. So the town, once annexation is completed, uh, would be looking at between four to 500,000 in positive revenue for the town of Windermere as a whole for the 74 parcels. Hey, Robert, if I can add one more thing. Yes, sir. Uh, again, we, we do know some of the residents already, and I know uh, we don't have a lot in either one of our jurisdictions, but uh, about six months ago, Orange County Sheriff's Office had a significant um, um, burglaries that were going on and helicopters and everything were over the area. I can tell you that within about um, 15 minutes, one of the Chandelock residents called me, texted me. I found out exactly what was going on was able to put their mind at ease, you know, what the perimeter was, where it was set up, and that it wasn't in Chandelock, but it was in a neighborhood just to the uh, west of them. So I think that direct access between that, um, our Windermere Safety Watch bulletins that go out pretty frequently, just keeps the residents uh, very, very informed. As you guys know, communications, I think, is one of our, our great attributes in our department. And Mayor, to add, too, is that, you know, some of the apprehension I had some from some of the Windermere residents was, um, adding, you know, more people to the um, boat ramps, adding more people to the um, uh, tennis course. But as you can see with the 74 lots, most of them do have boat houses. Um, so they wouldn't require use of the Fernwood or Bessie boat ramps. And again, as Chief said, I think the impacts to the Main Street courts or anything else be uh, de minimis, at it, if any. Robert, could I just add one thing to the parks just to support what you said there, Robert? One of the pieces of analysis we had did, did do in your study, we do have to look at the level of service that you have in your comprehensive plan for parks and recreation and what you have adopted for your parks and recreation for your different facilities like tennis courts, boat ramps, bike path. Even with the annexation, you, you far exceed what your requirements are in terms of what you already provide in the town. So there's, there's no concern with that. So to sum it up before we get to questions is that, you know, staff looked at this as a selective annexation. Um, it's a gated community, wouldn't have any negative um, financial impacts or level of service impacts to the town of Windermere or its residents. Um, and we believe that this just makes sense. It's contiguous, it's compact, again, it's gated. Uh, they'll be taking care of their roads, their uh, stormwater. Uh, and the signage, they can also apply for stormwater credits of 25% once in extend. Um, and once they are in extend, then we'd have to wait that lag for probably a, um, a taxable year. So again, the, the financial impacts for the town is really not going to be substantial enough to outweigh the uh, amount of money that uh, the town would receive from the annexation after it's all said and done. And with that, I'll turn it over to questions, Mayor. Thank you all. Um, Council, any uh, questions for the presenters at this point? Then we'll go to public comment. Um, I have a few questions. Hang on. Um, uh, thanks, Brandy. Will you use your little hand up thing? And uh, oh, yeah. Mandy, yeah. Um, David will go, and then you'll be next. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Brandy. Mandy. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Brad, I just have a, well, probably just one question, but going back to the voting thing. So we can, I just trying to wrap my head around what you said. So we can have just the Chandelock neighborhood, but then you mentioned if we open it up to the town that both have to approve it. In other words, the majority of the town would have to be voting yes. I'm, I'm assuming, and then most of Chandelock. How do we, I mean, I know we figured that out with voting. We, we know that, but if the majority, but it, they both have to agree, can't have, like if the majority of the town says no, then that's it then. Even if Shonda Locke says yes, I, I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out. If they've already agreed to it, then we're kind of really putting it into the town's hands. Is that-, is that You are correct, it? right. That's okay. correct. Yeah, under the statute, if you go both voting, both have to approve it. So if 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 Shonda Locke registered voters who vote support it and approve it, but town of Windermere registered voters who vote don't approve it and they deny it, then the annexation does not move forward. Okay. The 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 main issue that I 
had um, residents mention is just the fact that they can get on council and and do things. Robert, I think this is for you. Did uh, it said a year? Is that a year after annexation or a year that they've just lived in Chandelok? It would be a year after residency within the town of Windmere. And again, um, we all know how hard it is to um, get people to volunteer for free to sit on town council, especially when it's boarding sometimes. Yes. So again, with the 74 lots and the uh, 100 plus um, resident electors, um, you know, it's it just adds to that. Um, you know, if, if the town were to look at larger areas in the future, then we may look at the possibility of uh, districts and then have the mayor as far as a, a district wide um, uh, election. Um, but with this small of an annexation, as far as the political impact, I don't see it being significant. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all my questions. But they I would, would they love would. to have people knock on the door down to run for election and council and have elections. That would be great. And it would open the door for them to immediately sit on um, because it just means that they have to be a resident of the town of Wintermere. They can sit on various boards and committees. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Councilperson Mandy. Brandy, you're up. Okay, so I want to kind of back up here for a minute, and this is based on a lot of questions that I've been getting from people too. So um, what has been annexed into the town so far that wasn't originally part of like town limits way back when? Is it all of the HOAs that we currently have? Pretty much, yes, because I mean, mm -hmm. we'd have to go back all the way to 1927 uh, from the original plat and see how we've expanded over the... Uh, the course of the history of the town of Windermere, but I believe in 2008 or 2009, when the uh, town did annexations, they focused on um, the manors, the willows, um, Marina Bay, Marina Bay, and then um, the area of Estancia. Yeah, at Sunset. The only other one would be Sunset. Sunset Bill. Sunset. Yep. Yeah. Sunset Bay. Sunset Bay. Sunset Bay. Thank you. Okay, and it's like. Oh, I'm sorry. And the area along Lake Butler Boulevard looked like it was annexed in the mid to late 1980s. Which, and that was, what about Lake Crescent? Is it one of our HOAs? Crescent Reserve or whatever it's called, sorry. Not to look at yeah. all, but it's not just areas that are HOAs, like, like Lake Butler Boulevard. We don't have HOAs all along there. So some of right. the areas that have been annexed are just areas that have been annexed over time. Yes, the property that was west of Windermere Recreation Center was annexed in, which I believe is the area yep. that you're talking about. Yes, it's a separate one. Okay. Okay. Um, another question that I have from somebody is, would the rest of the residents' millage rate be reduced by adding Chandelac? There's a possibility, but that's not a guarantee. Um, you know, some of the residents of Chandelac, you know, the question that they ask is, well, once you annex in, do you have the opportunity to raise taxes? And my answer is yes. Any council has the opportunity to raise those taxes if they want to. Um, but my response to that is take a look at our track record. Um, we've kept our um, millage rate stable since 2018. Um, in addition to that, I think, you know, town council and the mayor have been very um, cost conscious when it comes to any increases in uh, the millage rate, if it's not for a specific person or purpose. Um, but with the amount of money that we would be gaining from this um, selective annexation, um, you know, I it, it'd be unlikely that I believe this current town council or future town council would increase the millage rate. Um, but there is a possibility of uh, lowering the millage rate um, if we are to see pretty much a windfall from, um, you know, the possibility of you know, the, the fire department assessment may be lowered uh, from point A to point seven because it, that, that's pretty much a fixed cost each and every year. Um, you know, we don't know if the cost from Waste Pro are going to be lowered or, you know, hopefully stabilized some, at some point based on uh, the way the CPI is increasing. Um, but I do not foresee an increase in taxes, um, but there is always a possibility for an increase or a decrease in those taxes. It all depends on what projects we're looking to fund and um, how we're trying to move forward. So, okay. and let me let me let me just um, chime sure. in there for one second. Um, so, 
you know, with any council mm -hmm. every year has the option to raise or lower councils, whether there's annexations or or not. I, I think generally, though, it's been our traditional stance to look at um, selective uh, annexation in a way that hopefully you're bringing someone into the fold that brings a lot to the table in terms of waterfront, in terms of, uh, you know, minimal costs and uh, to, to keep up uh, the area, um, you know, kind of adds to the adds to the melting pot that is Windermere and, and, and they are kind of conducive to um, meeting some of our objectives, which some of those are to increase the waterfront acreage and things like that wherever possible um, in a selective manner. So I think that we look at these types of situations as hopefully they're bringing something to us that allows us, uh, allows that, that whole to be better, allows us to do some things maybe we wouldn't be able to do. Um, but of course, council always has that opportunity every year when we budget to raise or lower. Brandy, I turn the floor back over to you. Okay. Um, I mean, and you 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 said like a couple of things like lakefront, but one of the things I had somebody ask is what are the pros to the town really other than revenue? Because so far I'm not getting positive feedback. So so there's the there are several positives and I'll you know I'll let others talk on these too, but I mean so the positives are you control what is near your borders, okay? So if you don't, if, if we don't annex this at some point, someone else will. You may like that, you may not like that, but I promise you that someone will. Um, can be good, can be bad, but it's always better. If we, I think if we look at history, when we have these opportunities like this, they're always wise to take. Um, the Four Corners is another example of something that we've had to fight and to try to regulate with minimal uh, abilities to do so because we didn't take those opportunities when they were there. Um, you know, so there's there are situations where you've got to look at it and say, you know, if there's no negative, it's probably a positive, um, especially in the, the size and scope of this. It, you know, if you look at other larger properties, well, that's a little different equation. You have to have a, a much deeper conversation and, and a much deeper evaluation in terms of, of what of what someone else might bring in. Uh, but when you look at these smaller, you know, 51 single family dwelling units, it's, it, it's, it's probably, it, it just skews heavily towards the positive. Um, Brandy, go ahead. Um, okay, so the other thing is, and this is kind of maybe a bit of a question um, for Brad, I don't know, or whoever. Um, so, you know, when we talk about, you know, that they already have potable water, um, but the sewer is our biggest cost item that, you know, the town is going to probably face in the next 20 to 30 years, um, because it's a significant cost. So the moment they're annexed in any plans that we have to do, you know, sewer system in town, then now has to include them. Um, and, you know, mostly we're saying there's all this revenue, there's no cost to the town but wouldn't the cost of the sewer system be significant because of how far they are from the central portion of town and how far it has to extend out, there's still gonna be a cost associated to that that's gonna come with annexing them. So I had yeah. somebody asking me about that. I can answer that, Brad. I mean, because it is contiguous, especially with Lake Bella Boulevard with our plans when they come through relative to uh, wastewater services, um, you know, it, Funding sources is always going to be an issue, um, whether we look at a municipal service taxing unit or a municipal service benefit unit. Um, you know, if we were to do a MSBU or MSTU, this adds more people to that pot uh, in order to fund the overall system. Um, but again, the fact that it is contiguous, you know, that 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 runs going to be a lot shorter. But yes, if we were going to self fund this then definitely the, the, the town would have to bear that cost. But in order for that money to be feasible for us to do sometime in the future, um, we would have to look at either federal dollars, state dollars to offset a lot of that cost. Um, but we would probably be looking at either the MSB or the MSTU um, to fund that that wastewater service. So the, so the reality is that no one's likely coming to fund our our sanitary sewer system in full so there's always going to be a cost to the town to the residents whenever this day comes um 
you know, this is this is a reality that even with even in the best of funding scenarios, there's going to be a cost to, to each and every resident in, in reality. OK, um, so one of the other things that I got and this is this is, I guess, just to, to confirm and, you know, to also to put it on the record. So I received an email today um, that was correspondence back in, I guess, November. Um, and it was an answer that had come from Brad to a resident about the number of existing homes and what this resident had dis defined as the core, quote unquote, of Windermere versus the remaining areas of Windermere. And their definition of core was from the bridge on Main Street to the north, uh, Chase Road to the south, uh, the boat ramp on Conroy Windermere Road to the east, and the lake to the west. And so this is what the person was defining as the old original Windermere. Um, mm -hmm. And that in that core area, as of the time that this was uh, calculated, I guess, which was based on August 2023 data from Orange County Property Appraiser, there were 578 homes currently in the core. Mm -hmm. And in the remaining areas of Windermere, which some people in, are calling the outskirts, there are 585. So right now we're pretty much at a 50-50 split of the people kind of on, you know, the isthmus and a little bit to the east. And then everything else is HOAs and whatever that's been annexed in. So is, is that data correct, Brad? And is it still similar? I mean, I guess this was back in August. I don't know if you've looked at any of it since then. Well, Brad, yeah. I, I, first of all, I would, I would disagree with the, uh, the, the, the core area, as far as they described it, would be from the canal south to chase north um, to the boat house or the boat ramps west. Um, but remember, even parts of 2nd Avenue had to be annexed in at some point in order to make sure that um, the town had control those areas. And I think what they're calling as far as the old um, old town or you want to call it would be the, the dirt roads. Uh, so everything with dirt roads would be considered that that core area. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. So. Half dirt roads, half not dirt roads at this point, sort of, uh, for a loose loose definition of which section is which. But I think it's, it, listen, it's important to note, and, and, and for the record, there there is no such thing. We are one town, one when you're, everyone is represented the same. And, and I think it's super, super important to make sure that we all understand and, and I know that everyone that works on council realizes that, um, you know, there is, there are the dirt streets and there are paved streets, but we are one town, one Windermere, and uh, there's nothing in this that's going to change the character of either um, community. Now, there are larger annexations that have been discussed in the past that certainly have the potential to do that. Um, but I think I just want to make sure that we're looking at the same thing um, in terms of, you know, if you're going to bring in a thousand houses, that's a much different conversation than bringing in 51 contained units. Well, I, my only other, my only other comment would be, I, I remember back at the October meeting, um, there was a workshop, which I wasn't on council then. I do remember one resident um, that spoke that had made a comment about being worried about the dilution of the residents. Um, and I and I don't mean that, I don't mean it in any way to say that I don't consider the manors or willows or any of them part of town. They are a part of town. I think that the concern is like, even with the most recent, um, you know, wine bar issue that came up it was a lot of residents saying, you know, or the pavilion, or, I mean, you take your pick of anything over the last two years, that residents who live in the dirt street area are impacted the most by these decisions of whether there's going to be a pavilion or whether there's going to be, you know, you know, pet fest expanding or, you know, like taking the break in the summertime now from food trucks, because everything that happens in the central downtown impacts the lives of the people who live on the dirt streets just a little bit more if it's a big event than it does on the outskirts like the people who live on the other side of Shonda and Shondalock 
they're not going to be disturbed by people parking on their roads. They're not going to have the events happening, the pavilion, talks of paving the roads, which we've gone through, um, and all these different things. So a lot, and I've actually had quite a few people that are concerned with, I guess, what you would call a ratio, because the more people we bring in, then those people have that chance to say, well, then, you know, yeah, we want a pavilion. Yeah, we want this because it's not in my backyard, NIMBY. It's not in their backyard. It's part of their town, but it's not going to impact them the same as about half of our residents who are on the downtown. Um, so anyways, that that's the end of my comments and you guys are free to comment back. Uh, my only other comment would be that I think that the last few years council has done, a, even before I was on, of course, um, a great job of starting to be more transparent and starting to listen to the feedback of the residents and hear what they want. And I feel like doing a referendum only for Shonda Locke is kind of taking a step backwards in that um, because I think there's been a, you know, a lot of strides forward in the town really listening to the feedback of what the residents want. So personally, I think that the referendum should include the town to have a say so because it is gonna affect them in some way, shape or form. So I just don't think that our residents should be left out of that vote when it comes to the referendum. So that's all for me tonight. Thank you, Brandy. I would say that um, the majority of the individuals from Chandelac who want to uh, participate in downtown events currently participate already. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying. Thank you. Councilperson David. Hey, thanks, Mayor. From the, Mayor. Out from the outskirts. Yeah, for, first of all, I want to I just want to say how appalled I am at uh, council member Haynes implication that I can't take into account folks that live in the dirt roads feelings and and desires because I don't live on a dirt road. That is completely completely false. I think I've done and and several council members that have that don't live on dirt dirt roads represent this town as uh, residents of Windermere first. The implication that I can't vote on something based on where I live is completely insane. First of all, um, you know, and I'm sitting here. I the, the entire time uh, Council Member Haynes was talking, I just had to bite my lip because. That, that whole implication just, it, it drives me insane. I've heard it before. Um, I have taken great pride in serving this town um, and representing the entire populace fairly and listening to the residents regardless of where they live. That's first. So now that I've gotten that rant out of the way, I've got a couple questions for Brad. Brad, first of all, um, the uh, costs to... Um, maintain roadways, sidewalks, um, power systems, things, those are all borne by either the utility company or the HOA, HOA correctly? Correct, everything inside the gates are borne by them, yes, sir. Okay, um, secondly, um, the gating of the community, um, does that preclude any uh, law enforcement or fire response? Not at all, and they would coordinate with Chief Ogden to make sure their system complies with the town's gate ordinance, where Chief Ogden assures that the system for emergency access is useful and, and works for them. So okay. it would not. Okay, those are my two correct questions and a, a slight rant. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hey, Robert, if I can kick in, we, we follow the same ordinance as the county, so they have clicked to enter, so we, we, have, we have access already. Yes, sir. Thank you, Councilperson David. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean this this whole thing about you know outskirts and core and you know it it is it is very difficult to hear. Um, you know we we operate as one town. We treat everyone as one town. We listen to everyone, no matter where they live. Um, we listen to people that don't even live in town. So uh, I mean I think that it's a uh, it is a little bit of a tough pill to swallow to hear that um, uh, those types of statements for sure. Um, and I, this has nothing to do with diluting or or anything like that. This is this is this is this is 
clear economics uh, and, and making smart moves that allow us to maintain a reasonable millage rate, um, maintain our services, use our services more efficiently and effectively. Um, we basically serve these folks who live there anyways. Um, you know, I can't think of a single issue that we've had with this particular area. Um, you know, I mean, it, it is a, you know, there are just some of these that come about that are, they're just super sensible. You know, again, there are those that will require deep conversation and, and lots of discussion and uh, really weighing the pros and cons. In my mind, even talking to some of the most conservative residents, uh, this is not it. This is, it, it's just plain sensible. Um, any additional comments from council or questions? I'd like to get public input now, unless there's yes, anyone. Yes, I have some. I do. Okay, I, I find it unfortunate that you find that you're appalled by this, Tony, because what I was referring to was not how council's decisions votes were. It was that the residents of the town who don't want these things feel that other residents who are not going to see things the same way as they do downtown will feel that way. These are not my, just my comments. In fact, most of them aren't. These are all things I have written down, the email I received from a resident, comments from residents about their concerns about the diluting happened at the last workshop. I invite you to go back and listen to that because that was not my comment. I have probably 15 texts right now just said that was not correct. My comments weren't about council. They don't know why you feel this way. And these are coming from residents, not me. So, you know, I hope that these residents will reach out to you in addition, Tony, as to just reaching out to me, because this is comments coming from the constituents of this town, not just me. And, and it's very unfortunate that you feel that it's like a personal attack on you. I literally just said that I feel like council members have done a great job at listening to feedback over the last few years. So I, I, I guess you missed that component, but I, you know, for the residents that are listening, that have sent me messages, I hope that you reach out and, and let Tony know that this is the way you feel rather than people just thinking this is my opinions because it's, it's very unfortunate that you can't see past that. Any additional comments from council? I'm good, Mayor. All right. All right. We have the opportunity for some public input. If you'd like to raise your hand and let us know. Um, Frank Krenz, please. If you'll just give us your name and address um, as you do this as well, just for the record. Thank okay, you. Frank Krenz, can you hear me okay? We can, sir. Frank Krenz, 727 Forest. Um, I, I'm very impressed with the package, with the uh, presentation, all the work that was done. It's really good, thorough. Um, and I, and, and you've answered most of my questions. Um, relative to what, uh, Brandy just said, um, I remember a mayor that we had one that wanted to annex Salworth, wanted to pave all the roads. Um, it was a very different time. <laughs> uh, you know, in that era, I think town council wasn't listening. I think the mayor was uh, often kind of blue yonder. Um, there is a risk, in my view, of annexing, not this annex. I, I don't think there's any risk, really. Um, Alworth, on the other hand, would be, on my view, would be a substantial risk, and I would um, be concerned about the very kinds of things that Brandy was talking about if we annexed Alworth. So, Understood. happy to... Yeah, you no, know, Frank, I, I totally hear you. I mean, again, and that's why I really want to be clear here this is not that and, and you know what i'm saying so yes um i want everyone to understand that that there are um, annexation propositions that could significantly change the character right 
and that is important. And there, you know, should that ever be considered one day, you would need to have a whole entirely different charter to make that work. Um, I'm not a proponent of that, but it is a, you know, but I, I do want to be really clear that this particular situation actually helps support the healthiness of the town in order to not make those other types of annexations necessary in the future or even the discussion in the future. Council will always have the ability to have those conversations. Um, you know, and you're right, we can't predict the future, but I do trust that, you know, we have good people. You know, we don't have, uh, I, I've, I've served proudly with lots of individuals from these HOA communities and they are they are just as engaged, uh, if not more sometimes. They are very open-minded. You know, they worry about their street. They worry about the whole town. And that's exactly what a good council person should do. Um, but I mean, I, I, there is no, I'm telling you, having the pleasure of serving with several, there is no difference. I, I appreciate that. And I, I agree that I, I, you know, you've allayed any fears I've had about annexing this you know this uh, community. I, I think it's pretty much zero risk, and and everything sounds like uh, a benefit as opposed to a, a negative. You know, one of the things too, just uh, you know, I'll just uh, we're going to have uh, Bill Martinez got his hands up. We'll have him speak next. But you know, one of the things that people that we we need to remember is there are certain situations. You know, some people weren't thrilled with certain annexations there, but you know, you prevent by controlling your borders and boundary, you can prevent things like having, you know, four story uh, apartments right at your doorstep. So, you know, that can't happen in this case because this is already built out, but you know, they're just kind of, you know, if, if you can control these things, it gives you a tremendous ability to, to predict and to plan what your community looks like. The other, the other example I'll use is, you know, a very wise council in the past took the opportunity to control our roadways that came through town. So Main Street and Conroy Windermere. If they had not done that, those would be four lane roads now. And that would really have changed the character of our community. So, you know, sometimes we got to do these smart things that are small and bite sized so we don't have to kind of deal with some of these things that are kind of earth uh, changing for us. So thank you, Frank. I appreciate your input as always. Okay. Great job. Uh, okay, if I can say on, one more thing. On the memorial service today. Oh, uh, yeah. Mr. Martini, sir. Thank you. Oh, I think Frank had one more thing to say. Oh, yeah, Frank didn't mean to cut you off. Which is okay. unusual for Frank. So, yeah, again, I, I think this is this is <laughs> a great- control. <laughs> I think what you're doing is the right thing and and I, I'm totally with it. I would say there's a risk. There, there aren't many people on the call. Um, like with the well, like with the pavilion, I think if you put it out there for the town to actually make the decision, you're taking a big risk. If you if you open that up to a town vote, I would advise against it. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, it's a it is a um, so listen. This is a, a situation where you have, uh, you know, everybody loves affordable housing. No one will vote for it next door. So, I mean, it's just something to factor in. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Mr. Bartini. Uh, yes, hello. I think I'm probably repeating uh, stuff that has already been said, but but I think it's, a, it's really a safe bet to annex Sean Duloc. Uh, I mean, we, we get additional revenue. There's, there's very little additional uh, cost to provide the services to that area. We increase our buffer with Ocoee and Orange County because, uh, like you said, eventually somebody's going to grab it. And, you know, these people are already our neighbors. Like Chief said, uh, you know, most of the people that live there already feel like they're part of our town, uh, our community. And, you know, it's a good, it's a prime, it's a stable, mature community. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a no brainer for us to annex them. I don't think there would be a big impact on politics, uh, you know, as far as council goes, and even if it did, you know, even if somebody did throw their hat in the ring, it may prompt some other people who are on the fence to jump in as well. So, you know, maybe a little healthy competition, but it's not like, you know, 
as we've seen in the, in the last few elections. It's not like people are beating down the door to uh, to get those positions. And, um, you know, but like I said, those folks are already our neighbors. They're already, you know, part of this town. So I, I would welcome them in officially. Uh, other, other communities, uh, as Frank mentioned, absolutely not. But that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was Bill Martini, 608 Ridgewood, right? I get that right? 627 Ridgewood. Ah, 627. Close. All right. Um, any additional public comment at this time? All right. Seeing none. Council, so, you know, as always, we have these workshops um, so we can take the feedback from, from previous meetings and workshops and discussions, as well as those meetings with um, the area uh, requesting to be annexed. Um, and what, what our guide here is tonight is to see if we want to move forward um, with the process to give staff direction and exactly how they would, how that would look. Um, you know the options in front of you, so uh, not looking to poll anybody, but I think what I'm trying to do is get a general consensus of where everybody is at on this. Uh, basically, I think there's there's a couple options. There's a, there's an affirmation that says we'd like to move forward with this. Typically, when we do these annexations, we do not do a townwide referendum um, for those reasons that we have talked about. There's cost involved with that as well. Um, but obviously council can make their desires known if we can consolidate that and give that direction to staff. Anyone want to chime in? Council person Depp. Yeah, Mayor, I think we should move forward with this. Referendum or no referendum, sir? Uh, no. Okay. Council person uh, David. Um, I I vote to move forward with this. I know we're not voting, but move forward with it and no town vote. Councilperson Williams. Move forward with it, no referendum. Councilperson Haynes. Move forward with the referendum for the town residents. So um, move forward, but with referendum, right? For any of that, but just to be clear. Correct. Right. I think Thank it, you. I think the residents should be heard. Councilperson Stroop. I personally have no objection to the annexation. I like hearing from the residents on issues that affect all of us as a town. So I, yes, move forward. My ch personal choice would be referendum. But I don't, have, I don't have a problem with annexing it personally. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your input as well. All right. I, I also I do want to say one thing to clear uh, to be clear as well. Not have not having a referendum does not mean there's no input uh, by the public. There will be several opportunities here. I think two additional uh, meetings to discuss just this. If I'm is that correct, Robert? What's our schedule? Yes, we'll, we'll have. I'll get you one second. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, we'll have at least more than one. Um, we're planning on having um, two public input meetings um, with the Shondalock residents. We'll also have two public meetings with the uh, community at large. Um, then as far as the referendum and ordinances that have to be associated with that, with the report and sending it to Orange County, that gives them a lot of um, opportunities for various bites at the apple, so to say. Yes. Oh, one second. One second. <laughs> Heather, why don't you go ahead now? Mayor, no, I was just wanted to, I wanted to point out to you that there has to be by statute, at least before the ordinance is adopted, two advertised public hearings of the for the town, just like your normal yes. um, meetings. There has to be. So. Yep. So several uh, opportunities for public comment, several opportunities for public input, um, as well as an open hearing uh, that will take place uh, on this matter if if it moves uh, forward. So just, I wanna make sure that we're clear on that. Um, there are, you know, certainly there are issues with referendums. Um, we have used them in the past for 
for example, borrowing money for the building. Um, we have not in the past had a referendum for um, annexation of any area in town. So just a little historical perspective. All right. So I think staff, does that give you the direction you need? All right, sir. I'm sure you're my son and my dog. It's all right. He's he's welcome. We'll take his input too. Uh, he just wanted an iPad to play uh, Minecraft and uh, Roblox. I don't blame um, him. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the direction that we wanted was to figure out if we wanted a, a townwide referendum or just a specific referendum for Sean um, You know, we've gotten that guidance uh, tonight. You know, that can always change when um, there's meetings with town council and we have the public input Absolutely. meetings and so on and so forth. But um, anyway, yeah, no, definitely. I appreciate the input. All right. Thank you all. We appreciate uh, everyone's input on this topic. At this time, we're going to move to our FY 23-24 mid-year budget report. Robert's going to report today on this item. Yes, sir. Again, sorry about that. My, uh, Do you need some time to load up Minecraft first or, or are, you, are you ready? Um, If I can have like maybe three minutes just for a uh, facilities break, that'd be great. That would be good. We'll make like hold music. Clerk Burkhalter. Yes, sir. I, th I knew you were on. Thank you for, for uh, popping in here. I see you now. Um, do you recall the last referendum? What was the cost for that? I do not remember off the top of my head, but the costs have gotten really expensive. And even with the new um, supervisor of election, we just had a meeting not long ago. Mm -hmm. And our normal elections rates have increased quite a bit. So okay. it's going to be, yeah, it'll be, there'll be a cost. Oh yeah, I know it's, it's, I, I want to say it's 10 grand at least. And I, and I, I, but we'll I'm get the, we'll get the, the actual number. And I'm listening to the conversation. I don't have a dog in the fight. But I can remember back in the early 90s, mid 90s, when annexation was discussed before Isleworth was even what it is. People used to park their cars with their boat trailers and park there to access the boat ramp over there. And, and how mm -hmm. the forefathers back then would say, you know, we really need to annex. We need to annex these groves to protect our town. And you, no, no, no. And I wonder today if that annexations would have happened, what the town would be like today. Yeah. No, it's always, it's difficult. And uh, it is. It's always difficult. You know, I use the railroad right away. I use the, you know, I know for a fact that, you know, there was a lot of opposition to the roundabouts. We would not be able to drive through this town today. Without Absolutely. Them. So, you know, yeah. it's, and, it, and it's hard, you know, it's, it's, it is, it is, it is difficult. And it's, you know, but that's why we have a good, uh, a good staff and good decision makers and mm -hmm. good input to, to try to make the best decisions that we can. And, and Robert was right about the west tip of Second Avenue. That had to be annexed into the town from the county mm -hmm. many, many years ago. They weren't originally in the town. Yep. All right, sir, I'm back. Sorry about that. All right. Now I, you, you just saved everyone from me singing. So you're, it's a good thing already. All right. Um, so again, thank you for the uh, the input on the um, uh, annexation request. Again, this is the uh, budget analysis report for the 2023-2024 budget. Again, this gives you a look of um, where we are in the current budget year and what we're looking at by the end of the fiscal year. And this also gives us somewhat of a roadmap for uh, next fiscal year and hopefully uh, possibly the next five years, depending upon what projects we're able to go ahead and fund. So the first thing we always look at is the revenue report. And again, we do very conservative estimates. And the way that we do that is we don't just look five years in the past, we look 10 years in the past. Um, so when I first got to the town of Windermere, I made sure that we created Excel spreadsheets because a lot of times what um, finance clerks do or um, town managers do is that they just 
increase everything by 5% thinking it's always going to go up. But as we've seen in a lot of um, the roller coaster that is um, you know, our current state of affairs right now, uh, things go up, things go down. And there's some things that um, weren't anticipated back in the day that are, you know, um, status quo right now, especially when it comes to community service, community, communication service tax. Um, you know, there's reasons why that's up and why half the sales tax is down. And we make sure that we're very aware of what's going on in the world to make sure that we're accurate with our um, revenues. And also there's sometimes there's, there's a, uh, anomaly that might occur. And I think we had that with the franchise agreement with uh, uh, Duke Energy, I think it was probably about five years ago. Uh, to where that would have thrown the entire uh, numbers off because we saw somewhat of a windfall uh, based upon the fact that they misallocated the amount of homes that were actually in the town of Windermere uh, through the annexations that were done in 2008-2010. Uh, um, so again, we try to take those anomalies out and make sure that whatever we're presenting to you is accurate and uh, make sure that it is, um, um, you know, we're being very cost conscious and making sure that everything is uh, accurate. Again, when we get to one second here, property taxes, whenever we do a avalorum assessment, um, again, we take your home and then we divide it into 1000. And then what we do is um, uh, we multiply that by 95%. And that's where we get the uh, cost estimates for the avalorum. So what we're receiving is what's going to be paid out is 3.391 million. The code enforcement action or action assessments, uh, we didn't have any this year. So it's going to be a wash when you see the expenditures uh, and revenues, they're both zero. So that's not going to be a negative impact. Uh, park and tennis passes, we actually seen an increase because, um, you know, with the Fernwood uh, uh, boat ramp um, and the gate codes, um, I think people are less likely to share those uh, codes and share those, those keys. So we have seen an increase in that. Uh, solid waste assessment, again, it's a tax assessment. So we're going to receive the entirety of that. Uh, HPB, we've seen an increase again because they are the benefactors of the um, uh, food trucks. Uh, tree board committee, you know, originally anticipated about $30,000. Um, they are the recipients of the farmer's market, um, but you'll see with the HPB, Tree Board, Parks and Recreation, their revenues are um, canceled off with their expenditures because what we do is we put anything that's over their um, or under their expenditures. So if they make more revenue than expenditures, that balances over that, we put into their restricted reserves so they can spend that later. And that'll come into account with uh, Parks and Recreation Committee. Uh, the franchise fee for Duke, again, we're going to see possibly a $15,000 shortfall on that one. Uh, again, it's being very conservative. Uh, with the half cent sales tax, we're going to see a little bit of a shortfall, about $12,000 on that. And typically with the half cent sales tax, communication service fees, and some of the state distributions, we work with the uh, Department of Revenue to get those estimates, but they don't provide those estimates until August, uh, which is after we have our budget sessions. So, they come in a little late, but we try to be, again, as close to possible of uh, what we came in last year and then project out what's going to come in in the next six months. Uh, zoning and plan review. Currently, we only received about 6,268. Um, typically, we reconcile that when a project is completed before they get CO. They have to uh, pay for everything that they have um, utilized to make sure the development is paying for itself. And what you'll be seeing at the June Town Council meeting is the possibility of increasing those planning and zoning fees. And that is due to the fact that we haven't increased those fees since 2014. Uh, federal appropriations, we haven't received those yet, um, but we're doing it as far as an estimate to cancel that cost out. So there's no negative impact. And you'll see that when we look at the expenditures in public works, that that is gonna be offset. Same thing that has to do with the um, American Recovery Act. We just have to make sure those uh, monies are committed by 2026. Uh, tree mitigation fund, we haven't received any money for the tree mitigation. Most of the time what's occurring right now is the fact that when people are found in violation, they have the opportunity to replant uh, on their property. And we saw that with the 500 block and we also saw it with um, um, Magnifica.
a one and done event, they were able to receive more money than they spent. Again, you'll see the offset in the legislative fund. Uh, interest, this is one of the things that we saw a significant increase in. This is because we have all of our reserves and other monies in interest-bearing accounts. Back in the day, we would see maybe ten to 12000 but with um, you know Tara and Teresa working very hard in finance, um, we've seen a huge windfall of plus uh, $60,500 in interest alone. And when you see at the very end, when it comes to adding to our reserves, uh, that'll hopefully increase for next fiscal year until we were able to spend those dollars. Uh, state appropriations roads, that is for Windermere Road and Main Roundabout. Uh, the multimodal, that is $1 million from the state appropriation. Uh, potable water, again, the $3.081 million. The wastewater study, three seventy-five. dollars uh, stormwater transfer, the reason we put the 131702 is to offset the cost for the uh, hazard mitigation grant programs that we're currently working under. Um, you know, it's, it's taken a lot of time and you'll see in the expenditures in public works that, um, you know, it's taken a lot of more engineering costs in order to get that increase in the um, state dollar or the federal dollars that's running through the state uh, in order to make sure that we're compensating for the cost of the increase from both Irma and Ian. Uh, oxygen surplus. Again, when we sold the uh, dump truck, we saw a, a huge increase in that. Um, utility taxes, utility water, going to come in pretty much at around what we budgeted. Uh, communication service tax. This is one of those things that um, we thought was going to go down uh, probably about five years ago. And it's one of the things that has been continuously attacked by uh, state legislators. Uh, but with everybody moving towards um, you know streaming services, um, bundling, stuff like that, we've actually seen a significant increase. And I don't see that ending anytime soon. Uh, local business tax, we're looking at about $10,000 which we originally planned for. Building permits, um, it might show it as a loss, but again, the revenue over expenditure is gonna be a wash because we have an 80-20 split. So whatever um, PDCS charges for their building permit fees, they get 80% of that and we've received 20% of that. Um, so when you look at the expenditures, they'll just have 80% of that 225. Uh, right away use permits, we have seen a significant increase in that. Uh, the reason why is because we've really cracked down on uh, what people are putting in the right of ways and making sure that they adhere to the right of way uh, use agreements. Uh, so we've seen a significant increase in that and making sure that people are abiding by the current rules and regulations that we have for right of use uh, agreements. Uh, FEMA state grant, um, what we received from Ian and Irma, we are making sure that we show the expenditures and revenues to make sure that they offset. Again, this is the continuation of uh, Tanya's great work uh, with Rostain to make sure that we're getting projects funded um, and that both Rostain is um, being paid and also any Additional monies that we get for projects is going to be reflected um, and offset the uh, revenues and expenditures. Uh, the general fund transfer for the HMGP that we were planning on for fiscal year 23-24, um, when you see the amount of money that we're going to have left over in reserves for this next fiscal year, we're going to deduct that from what we were going to transfer in, but I had to show it because um, that's what was budgeted, but we can go ahead and reduce that when we go to the uh, Budget amendments, budget amendment process. So again, code enforcement that's going to be offset because we didn't have the assessments. Uh, the half cent sales tax is down. The ARPA funds will be committed, um, and the one point three million dollars that we have, or one point three nine that we have right now, we just have to make sure it's committed to project by twenty twenty six, and we're definitely going to be able to do that with uh, potable water systems for West Second Avenue, Bessie Butler, um, and some of the other areas to make sure that we're offsetting some of that cost, especially from the HMGP grants and the 760 from the Safe Routes to Schools program that we've been waiting in the hopper for about four years. Um, you know, we're hopefully going to be able to break ground, hopefully in September and work towards that. But those monies will move over to fiscal year 24, 25. Anything we spend this year is going to be deducted and make sure that it's not a um, uh, budget hit because we plan for it. And I said building services and zoning deposits, um, the boards and committees are outweigh the costs and the miscellaneous um, that we had 
besides the surplus and auction that was increased because we received I think about 65 or $67,000 from waste pro for the damage they did at um, park and Maine uh, roundabout when they had a broken axle and um, uh, the oils. And then also when they turned on to Lake Buller Boulevard, again, interest was up state appropriations. The revenues are going to be outweighed by the expenditures to make sure that uh, it's offset. Um, the FEMA reimbursement is stormwater transfer. We'll cover each the HMGP engineering expenses, which I'll show you again in uh, public works. And again, the general fund transfer, we'll talk about that when we get to the very end. Any questions on revenues right now? I know I'm talking fast. So I just want to be very conscious of your time. All good so far, unless there's questions. Seeing none. All right, thank you. All right, legislative, traveling per diem, we always plan for 2000, but um, most of the time we do everything that's local and we try to do that with staff as well to make sure if there's uh, uh, anything that has to do with CLEs or some sort of um, certification for programs, we try to make it local as much as possible uh, unless their CLEs are coming up and they have to make sure that they get that education to make sure they keep their uh, licenses or certifications. Um, the biggest one, that has in legislative that should, would show you over would be the wine and done event. Again, whatever they receive in revenue, we show in expenditures to make sure that offsets so it's not a negative overall budget hit. The holiday social uh, came in under budget. And what I'm going to do for the next fiscal year is actually make this into a board and committee uh, to make sure that we're keeping track of what they have raised over what they spent to make sure if they have reserves, they're able to spend that for. Uh, not only the holiday social, but anything that they want to put towards a centennial celebration. And with the employee pre appreciation, again, when the costs went up, um, but $1,000 of that, uh, the Windermere Police Department Foundation usually um, gives $1,000 to um, the staff of the town of Windermere to offset that cost to thank them for all of their administrative help uh, for the Windermere Police Department Foundation. So again, when you take a look at all the costs, um, especially with the fact that um, wine and done was $26,000 over, the overall um, budget impact would be, uh, you'd be over by $13,912, which without the uh, increase in the uh, Winnemere Wine and Dine, you would be underneath. Uh, with West Orange Times, again, I really get into each and every detail of every cost um, when you see Tara and Teresa work with me. I have every single dollar that is spent. And I go through each and every one to pick out which anomaly is not something that we're going to have to look forward to for next fiscal year. And then what we could possibly save on, or we can identify what is starting to increase over the, the period of time. We make sure that's reflected not only in the six or the uh, budget analysis report, but it's going to be reflected in the 24-25 um, budget. Any questions on the legislative? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. Uh, administrative, again, salaries um, going to be under a little bit because we had transitions within the um, um, executive assistant. Um, the biggest increase, again, is related to the legal fees associated with the boathouse litigation. Um, currently, we would have been on track for the $100,000. Uh, that we budgeted, um, but for the 140 uh, that we currently have expended uh, up to this point, this fiscal year, um, for the boathouse litigation. And this amount would hopefully take us to the point of um, trial, understanding that I believe in August is when we have the summary judgments. Uh, iVenture is going to be under a little bit. Um, Again, that's something that uh, Chief and I, we negotiated with iVenture um, by working with uh, Oakland, ourselves, and trying to get a fixed cost so it's easier for us to budget for to make sure that um, if somebody is doing a, a software upgrade or something like that, we're not paying by the hour. We're just paying per um, station or per employee. Um, so we're not worried about them um, sitting around for three hours while something updates and being, being charged per hour on that. Uh, server refresh, that was something that was not anticipated. Uh, I think you guys 
all understood when uh, we had that issue. I think it was in January, February, where the uh, servers went down uh, and we had to um, pretty much reinstall everything and make sure that everything is working accurately. Uh, so that was an unanticipated cost, but you can see that it falls underneath the um, 27,000 that we saved with iVenture for them to do the server refresh. And so the total amount that you see here, I'm sorry, it's a little off center, um, is that we're going to be over in administration by 175, 624. But keep in mind, we would have been under by about 24,000 and change uh, if it was not for the uh, legal services for the uh, boathouse litigation. Any questions on uh, administration? See none. Nope. And a lot, of these, a lot of these items that you see um, does show that we are staying either at around what we originally anticipated. Um, and so when you see something that's under, um, more than likely it might stay the exact same unless you know inflation goes up and stuff like that uh, for next fiscal year. So it just shows you that um, Dorothy, Tanya, Chief, uh, myself, and uh, all of our staff are being very cost conscious. And it shows, again, it will be very reflective to the residents that we are making sure we account for every dollar that is spent. And one of the things that we always tell people is, you know, if they're asking for something, it has to be a need, not a want. And it's like asking if you're taking out of my own personal bank account. So I make sure that everything is accounted for. Um, nothing too out of the ordinary here with advertising. Um, we had some ordinances, some... Um, the assessment notifications and stuff like that, that was a little bit over. Um, I did include the elections, even though we didn't have an election this fiscal year, um, but I did include $1,000 allocation in case there was a referendum this fiscal year for uh, the annexation of Chandelac. Any questions on clerk? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. Uh, salaries, uh, pretty much when you see salaries, FICA, FICA Med, retirement, healthcare, dental, vision, life, life ending, and gap insurance. Um, most of the time it's going to remain constant, you know, unless we do a 3% uh, increase for the employees. Um, one thing to notice too is whenever we do uh, a budget session, we typically do not, do not get the um, healthcare benefits until probably August. So we try to predict as much as possible and try to see the trends in various um, healthcare coverages and how they're increasing, decreasing, and how we can make sure that uh, the town's uh, financial contribution to uh, retirement or to healthcare is uh, similar to what's in the uh, private industry. So we make sure the employees are taken care of, and if they need to buy into a plan, to cover their spouse or their uh, family, we make sure we try to make accommodations for that. But currently, the town only pays for pays for employee only. The auditor's fee we plan for twenty five thousand. Um, the current contract we have with McDermott and Davis is for twenty thousand, and the reason for that five thousand, if we were going to spend any of the ARPA funds over seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, we would have to do a single audit. And since we're not going to do it that year, we'll save the five thousand dollars. Spectrum uh, increased again, um, so we'll make sure we reflect that next fiscal year. Uh, tuition reimbursement, which is a, um, a great perk for the uh, town employees, is able to, for us to provide a um, thousand dollars, I think it's two thousand dollars per employee, uh, if they want to increase their education um, and get certificates for. Uh, that education and we reimburse them $2,000. Uh, they have to make sure they maintain a certain grade and also they have to make sure that the field that they are studying in is related to their current job position. So we've had um, Tanya has um, taken a lot of classes to enhance her education and I think uh, Deputy Chief Bonk has as well and some of the staff members have taken advantage of that too. So it's one of those added perks that doesn't add a huge uh, chunk to the uh, uh, budget but it does help with your staff and make sure that we have retention. Again, with finance, when you look at the totals, um, we're looking about 
about $9,000 under what we originally anticipated. Any questions on finance? I am not seeing any, Robert. Thank you, sir. Uh, development services, this is always hard to um, budget for because, again, you don't know what's going to uh, occur within a fiscal year when it comes to various projects or uh, developments. We have had a lot of um, development when it comes to the 500 block with uh, Magnifica and also with our comp plans and the possibility of looking at uh, annexation reports. But again, with the increase in the um, uh, fees that we'll be looking at in June, um, hopefully we'll be able to bridge that gap of that $50,000 over. Uh, but the professional services, that is something that is, you know, basically um, what you have for development. And the balance of that is for requests, for phone calls, uh, for Brad's time, um, and for the $130,000 um, when it comes to just a salary, um, for the amount of disciplines that uh, Wade Trim has, um, that price is a steal when it comes to having an entire um, um, uh, business as opposed to just one individual. So um, that that $30,000 that we're going to be spending over what we anticipated is going to be attributed to, again, a lot of the things that we discussed relative to um, extra meetings with 500 block, um, extra meetings that we have with Brad, uh, phone calls from council members to Brad, um, annexations, um, and other issues that come up that uh, we need to make sure that him and Amanda are paid for. Uh, building inspection fees, again, that 180 is the 80% of the 225 that we anticipated. So for everything, the um, um, total for development services is going to be over by about $50,000. Uh, but again, we can attribute that to a lot of the planning and zoning issues that we've had over this past fiscal year. Any questions on uh, development services? I think my only comment would be there, Robert, it, it, you know, certainly we want council to have all the resources and information that they need. Uh, I would encourage council though to, um, to check with staff first to see if they can get that answer for free. Um, and, and of course, if you can't get that answer, then, you know, always of course, feel free to, to use the, the professional folks that we employ to, to give us the exact details. Uh, but if there's the opportunity to pay nothing for the answer, it's good too. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, public Works, um, debt service for Main Street roundabouts. That is the last payment um, that we'll have in October of next fiscal year. So you will see the 216-145 in fiscal year 24-25. But in subsequent years after that, you will not see that cost. So that'll be added to uh, helping out pay for uh, CIP projects. When I say CIP, again, I use a lot of acronyms, uh, Capital Improvement Projects. Uh, debt service for facilities, again, it's 327. Uh, salaries came under because we had transitions within uh, public works, and we also had one individual that uh, had to take some medical leave. Uh, general engineering, the 55000 that was over, again, is attributed to not only, and this will come into the notes, uh, Glor Engineering, John Fitzgibbon, uh, Kimley Horn Associates. Uh, this is all the projects that we're currently working on and negotiating with either DEM, FEMA, uh, or other jurisdictions, FTOT, to make sure that, um, you know, the money that we believe is owed to us is paid. And so far, it's working pretty well with West 2nd Avenue. We're able to get that cost increase. With Bessie and Butler, we do anticipate that we're going to get that cost increase as well. Um, and again, so the HMGP grants will be paid out of that $115,000 that's going to be coming out of uh, the stormwater assessment because it is mostly stormwater related. Uh, lawn and maintenance, we changed, changed vendors and we also included additional landscaping in certain areas um, with the 9th and Oakdale. Uh, janitorial services, we did see an increase because we had to change services uh, and we have pretty much moved a lot of the stuff over to the responsibility of that janitorial service when it comes to a lot of the supplies. Uh, pest control, we do believe it's going to be 7,500. Lakefront maintenance, this was increased to a lot of the stuff that we have done uh, over in the Bessie area and some of the lakefront properties that were required by us by Orange County EPD. Uh, the wastewater study, 
Uh, we do have in here a 375, which offsets the uh, revenue that we're getting from the state for 375. We do th believe this is going to be under, um, and any money that is um, underneath what is allocated to us will give back to the state. Town hall decorations, again, you know, with the uh, inflation and the rising cost of things, we'll make sure that we allocate the uh, correct amount for next fiscal year. Um, miscellaneous facility repair. I think we had a well and a heat pump that went out. So that's why that is over. And again, that's a reason why we take a look at every single uh, expenditure to make sure we take the anomalies for next fiscal year. Uh, sidewalk bi bike path. Some of those monies were allocated in the um, road CIP, but that's going to be reallocated to uh, sidewalk bike path. That's $100,000 that we allocate every single year uh, per the 2018 tax increase to make sure that we are spending it on not only rehabbing what we got, but also looking at where we can improve the uh, sidewalk areas. I'm trying to figure out if there's any other anomalies here. Uh, signs and banners, we'll get to that. Uh, street roads, streets and roads CIP. Um, this is one of the things where I think we budgeted for about three, $3 million, $3,556 million. Um, and that was both the water design of uh, 3.081 million and also the streets and roads CIP. As you know, with the 2018 uh, tax initiative, we always put $400,000 away for uh, the CIP. So when you see the 400 over the 6,840, uh, the balance of that will go into a restricted reserve that is just going to be for road projects. Um, so that's going to help offset the costs of um, the roundabouts at Windermere and Main and also the um, improvements at Chase and Main intersection. And also we can put money away for the 6th Avenue roundabout um, improvements. Uh, multimodal. We did anticipate that this would be funded fully this fiscal year. Uh, it's not going to. So what you see reflected here is um, uh, 35680 and that was for a right-of-way um, uh, purchase that we make sure that we have all the railroad right-of-way. I think it was like maybe five or six years ago uh, that we were finally able to negotiate a deal to where we can start getting a lot of that railroad right-of-way, which is going to be on the west side of Main Street. Um, that has been in the talks and in the works for quite some time. Uh, the Windermere Roundabout, um, Windermere Road, uh, Main Street Roundabout, again, I show the revenues over expenditures, uh, West 2nd Avenue. Um, what I did here is um, the 265-741 is potentially what we're going to spend this fiscal year. This is not money that was allocated to us by the state or federal government. This is money that um, was going to be our match. So the revenue is not going to offset the expenditures on this one uh, until we get uh, the HMG, HMGP funds um, for that cost overage. But this is just what I'm anticipating spending for this um, until September 30th, this fiscal year. Um, the uh, CARES Act or American Recovery Act, again, I show that so wash. And then with Hurricane Ian, this matches, um, is actually below the 54,000 that we received from FEMA um, um, for Hurricane Ian. And as you can see, they're going to be under by about five hundred twenty-six thousand uh, dollars for this fiscal year. And again, it's um, not that we didn't want to get the projects done; it's just a matter of working with other jurisdictions to get through the red trade red tape to make sure that we get these projects done. So again, the multimodal they include the additional right of way, um, Hurricane Ian's offset by revenues, uh, general engineering, um, you know, with H KHA, Galura, JFP, or JPF. Um, and additional information for HMGP, FEMA, appropriation projects. And then we added projects throughout the fiscal year, which, you know, we make sure that we have enough money uh, when we talk about these projects that we can be able to cover those. And that would be the 9th and Oakdale, uh, the um, diverter, the 10th and Main, uh, the Rose property with the uh, purchase of the right of way. We're able to go ahead and improve the uh, stormwater improvements over there. Um, signage and various stormwater issues. If somebody requests signage in a certain location, we have to make sure that we have KHA take a look at that as well as John Fitzgibbon. Um, and then stormwater issues, again, they always arise uh, when somebody has a complaint. So we make sure that we have the engineers take a look at it and incorporate it into our stormwater study or something that, um, you know, we can see if we can remediate on a temporary uh, uh, purpose.
And the miscellaneous facility repair, again, we have the town hall porch and the heat pump. And the porch was uh, shoring up some of the back areas and also the uh, ADA ramp. And again, the streets and roads CIP is going to be offset with the revenues. Uh, the money will carry forward into the next fiscal year, fiscal year, less the expenses. Um, the miscellaneous repaving, that was over because the 9th and Oakdale diverter. And then again, we had the well pump for uh, miscellaneous, expen miscellaneous expenses, expenses. And then the jacket report bench. Uh, which we're still waiting on the uh, donation fees from that. And those are the two benches that are going to be added just south of the uh, um, our Armed Service Memorial on um, Old Brick, Maine. Any questions before we get to parks? Are those general donations for the uh, Jackie Report bench, or was it from one of the committees? Or One of the committees... Oh, I can answer that, Robert. One <laughs> was um, one bench is being paid for by Jackie Rapport's family. The other okay. bench is being paid for by Historic Preservation Board. Great. All right. Thank you so much. And then again, these are all the monies that we have through six months of the year. And currently we're in, I think, year or month eight. Um, so we try to project that as best as possible. But, you know, we may be off maybe five, $10,000 for certain things that have come up. Um, but again, we try to be conservative and we try to anticipate any costs that are coming up. And when we do the budget analysis, budget analysis report, the budget amendments in um, November, we'll make sure that all this is reflected to where you can see why something was over or something was under. For parks, uh, playground mulch, again, um, that price is always going up. We wanna make sure that we have um, um, authorized uh, either mulch or uh, tire shards or something like that to make sure that we um, are reducing our liability in case somebody gets hurt. Uh, the tree canopy, we always make sure that we raise everything up prior to hurricane season. So we do anticipate that going to $20,000. That may increase uh, based upon what we need to do. But every year we make sure that we try to raise everything up and trim all the dead leaf or the tree branches. Um, and having the arbors take a look at stuff to make sure that um, what we can and um, to make sure that we are, you know, keeping our tree canopy and also protecting it to make sure when storms come through or if there's a continuous issue, we make sure it's remediated. Arbor Day trees, um, this is something that's paid out of uh, tree board, but we recoup them the $5,000 and that's one of the uh, budget amendments we're going to have to do in November to show that offset of that cost. Uh, split rail fence, uh, we did purchase more of that. I'm guessing that's probably going to be about $3,000, so I'd be remiss to say that uh, that $1,000 is not going to be spent. We just added some split rail fence over by uh, where the community room was and also on the um, northeast corner of Forest and Sixth. Um, we want to make sure that we we're protecting the culvert that was there, the trees that were there, um, and some of the library uh, employees were parking too close to the trees and also too close to the culvert. So we want to make sure that we we're protecting that. And then for uh, Parks and Recreation, that capital CIP, again, this is another 2018 initiative that we want to make sure that we were adhering to. Uh, that all offset some of the costs of some of the um, Parks and Recreation Committee's um, um, enhancements to the parks with the shades and the additional um, equipment that we put over in um, Palmer Park and Central Park. Any questions on Parks and Recreation? This is separate from Parks and Recreation Committee. Seeing none. Thank you, sir. Please, <clears throat> again, with the transitions that we have and when it comes down to actual coding, um, you know, we like to budget everything out as far as when it comes to shift inferential, which is day shift versus night shift, uh, staff matrix changes when somebody goes from officer one, two, or three, uh, reserve salaries if they go over and above uh, what their allocation is for, uh, chief, correct me if I'm wrong, 16 hours a month? Uh, 20 hours a month. 20 hours a month. Reserve. Yeah, if, if they go over that, then we want to make sure that they're paid for that. Um, Off-duty, again, we're pretty low this uh, fiscal year, but uh, any off-duty is uh, the um, revenues outweigh the costs, so make sure that they're paying for that. 
Also, they pay an admin fee of about 10%. Over time, I always allocate the full amount in case there is a storm that comes through because, again, hurricane season starts on June 1st. Incentive pay is also included in salaries. Um, and when we have the coding through either ADP or through AccuFund, you have to pay a certain amount of money for each and every individual code that you put in. Um, but we just budget for it. And then um, we make sure that is covered within the salaries as an um, overall catch all. So when you see things that are underneath, um, that just adds to what was underneath of, with the 66,000 that we saved in salaries. And again, that was through some of the transitions um, with um, more veteran people retiring or our um, hiring of new officers and then retention of those officers as well. Again, FICA, FICA Med, uh, retirement, uh, that's all covered through um, the town. Uh, psychologicals, you know, again, with uh, all the people that we recruit, we have to make sure they do physicals and psychs. Uh, fire service agreement, that's something that's standard. Currently, we pay uh, 800000 I was probably thinking back in 20. 19, 20, 20, we we're paying 650. But again, that goes, that increases by uh, $50,000 each year. Um, radar certs, vehicle repairs have been under because we uh, make sure that if a car is about cycling out, because again, um, you know, we try to keep the car at least five years, but understand that um, police vehicles get more wear and tear than your normal average day vehicle because. Um, the officers are on patrol, they're driving around, they have to hit excessive speed sometimes. So there's a lot more wear and tear on PD vehicles than your own personal vehicle. Uh, copier maintenance, we had an issue with the uh, copy machines and we're gonna try to rectify that in the next fiscal year. Um, Chief wanted me to let you know that his car is 10 years old, so he might be uh, requesting one for next fiscal year. Uh, dispatch fee that usually goes up per the CPI each and every year. Again, we use um, Winter Garden for our dispatch fee. Power and DMS, we actually uh, added a, a system this fiscal year. Um, I think it was for the policies. Um, again, we want to make sure that we're um, accreditation compliant. Uh, we did have the 10 year um, DC memorial this year. I believe it's going to be underneath that $5,000 threshold. The Verizon Air Cards, this is something that we're planning on phasing out this fiscal year, but it's something that we believe is a necessity um, for the laptops, also for the My5. Um, with the uncertainty in today's climate, today's age, um, we'll try to reduce the amount of MiFi's that we have. And again, the MiFi's are the potable Wi-Fi systems. And if you don't have one, please let me know. We'll make sure that you have one so you can access the Wi-Fi in case you're in a rural area that doesn't have Wi-Fi. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think Brandy has one, uh, but we'll make sure that um, when you're traveling, you have it in case we have to have a uh, emergency session um, or when you're in a rural setting and you need to attend a town council meeting or uh, a workshop, you're able to do so. Um, here is reflecting or reflective of the um, 2024 vehicle one. Um, we had enough money to go ahead and um, pay for a car um, in full. So we weren't um, wanting to go ahead and uh, lease those uh, cars. And then with uh, vehicle two and three, those are uh, Deputy Chief Bonk, Bonk's car and Detective Wilson's car that you approved at the Maytown Council meeting for purchase. And again, I think this cost is gonna be offset with the uh, sale of those two vehicles. We had to buy a towing winch, which I don't believe was uh, anticipated for in this fiscal year. Uh, but the total amount that you have for police for fiscal year 23-24 is going to be about $110,000, $111,000 under what was originally anticipated. And again, here's the background uh, where we don't have a general ledger code for each section. Um, again, with transitions, the Sykes, the uniforms, again, that's that's always going to fluctuate depending upon your retention. Um, and then the patrol cars, and then the 2024 car that we purchased outright. Uh, the capital equi equipment was, um, I think it was like $4,000. That was something that we didn't anticipate, anticipate for in uh, the 2023-2024 budget, but that was the PD shed that we needed for um, ancillary storage. 
And again, we added the uh, policy software system for batteries. We uh, had to buy batteries for the speed trailers. And then we had for ammos and guns that was over for the 10 spear lawman training. Any questions on police department? We didn't have to pay for additional tires for uh, John Fitzgibbon this year, so that was great. Yeah, it's, I'm getting my tires are this year. There you go, sir. Uh, code enforcement. <laughs> I'm sorry, was there any additional questions for uh, police department? I didn't see any, Robert. Thank you, sir. Uh, code enforcement, special magistrate. Uh, again, code enforcement isn't to punish, it's to make sure that people are brought up to code. We haven't really had to take anybody all the way to an actual code enforcement hearing this fiscal year. Um, so I'm just anticipating that the max cost would be about $500 for uh, uh, Special Magistrate Myers' uh, work. Uh, code officer, again, um, that's basically a fixed cost, even though we do get a increase usually in um, March or April time frame. But I'm going to work with Craig Shandrix, the uh, new uh, city manager of ACOE, to make sure that we understand what that CPI is possibly going to be. Uh, so we can anticipate for that full budget cost for the end of the fiscal year. And we had to get a new workstation for code enforcement uh, because her uh, system was currently outdated. But as you can see, we're going to be about $7,000 what we originally anticipated. And with the compliance actions, you can see that we didn't spend any money. So we saved 5000 And with revenues, uh, we didn't receive 5000 So that offsets. Any questions on code enforcement? Seeing none, Robert. All right. Uh, boards and committees, uh, long-range planning. We typically don't really allocate any funds for them each fiscal year. Um, but this year, we're going to do a strategic planning session with them, like we're doing with HPB, um, Parks and Recreation, and Tree Board, uh, to make sure that they have goals and objectives and um, pretty much uh, give them guidance on um, what they need to start looking at over the next uh, couple of fiscal years and uh, um, give them better direction, I would say. Uh, Parks and Recreation, they're going to be over by about $100,000 uh, this fiscal year. You know, one is going to be offset by about, I think, one twenty five. what we're anticipating them for uh, revenues this year. Um, but the $50,000 that they have will be brought in from um, their specific reserves to offset that cost. So again, you have your board and committee reserves, which you have Parks and Recreation Committee, each and every year that they don't spend what they take in goes into a restricted reserves for them to go ahead and make recommendations for town council for park improvements. And that would come out of their reserve amount. The 25,000 that is allocated by uh, the town of, town of Windermere helps offset that cost and it also builds as well. So uh, we're very mindful with Parks and Recreation Committee. We meet them on a monthly basis and let them know where their financials are at. Uh, tree board, uh, the 5,000 out of that 8,803. So they're pretty much their expense, expenditures are about 3,000, uh, 303, but their revenues pretty much offset their uh, expenditures. And again, that'll go into the restricted reserve. And HPB, they're gonna be taking in 32,000 this fiscal year. And that is going to offset from the revenues. And again, that goes into a restricted reserve. Uh, Ways Committee, for next fiscal year, I've been working with Lysander on trying to revamp the um, the Ways Committee to get them back going um, and trying to work with the Florida League of Cities to um, not only get us some funding, but also some um, help and guidance on trying to recruit and retain uh, some of the um, Wintermere Active Youth Committee. Any questions on boards or committees? Seeing none, Robert. Thank you, sir. So revenues over expenditures, the total revenues and expenditures that we budgeted for pretty much offset each other at 16,081,141. Uh, what we're anticipating bringing in uh, for revenues for this fiscal year is 16,318,453. Again, you know, we show the revenues outweighing the expenditures when it comes to the state appropriations and the federal appropriations um, to make sure that, you know, there's we're not a deficit or, or way too above as far as what we anticipate and what we spent, because we do anticipate that going into a restricted reserve up until the point we actually spend that money. 
Uh, for the expenditures, we came in underneath at 15,692,997. So the difference is 625, 456, 56. Um, and that tells you again, we showed the revenue versus the expenditures for the state and federal <laughs> program. Sorry about that. Um, so it shows you the revenues over expenditures, and we did account for all the appropriations. So um, at around $625,000 would be able to be transferred to the reserves of the town of Windermere, which would put you, I think, about $2.3 um, or $4 million in your reserves um, for next fiscal year to utilize, to offset any of the cost increases for future projects uh, that we have coming up, or for, again, the potential for funding projects that uh, we're still waiting on those costs, maybe for a town hall. Um, or something else. And this doesn't account for the um, money that we have to repay um, Healthy West Orange, which we're still negotiations. I'm waiting for um, the Rotary Board to come back to me on a decision on the uh, $97,000 repayment. So in summary, with the conservative estimates of revenue and controlling expenditures, we will come in about 625500 into reserves. Uh, we continue to submit for reimbursements related to grants awarded, and those grants are not really reflected in the revenues until we receive them. And the balance of uh, the ARPA funds will be pretty much com committed to in 24-25 to make sure we meet that 2026 threshold. Um, and the 760 from um, Representative uh, Demings uh, probably about four years ago. Uh, we make sure that's going to be rolled into next fiscal year. And again, the balance of the appropriations are going to be rolled into next fiscal year. So look ahead for next fiscal year, which is 2024, 2025. Uh, you may think it's too early to plan for that, but um, typically we have our first budget um, hearing in mid to late July, um, or not budget hearing, but budget workshop. And we typically have two July, August, and then our hearings would be in September. Um, but we're currently working on that, and we're currently making sure that uh, there's not going to be a request to increase the millage. Um, again, we're working on the Butler Basin stormwater project and potable water system, Bessie uh, stormwater potable water system, West 2nd Avenue. Again, we've got that increase um, from FEMA, which is fantastic. Uh, the Old Dirt Main paving and potable water system, this would be from uh, West 2nd Avenue north to the canal. Uh, phase 1 of the ward trail, which includes the... Uh, um, pedestrian bridge, uh, the wastewater report, which we're going to be able to spend those state appropriations, hopefully this fiscal year, but it depends on how uh, quickly KHA can get that. And I believe that they were trying to get it done within six months, which takes us into the next fiscal year. Uh, pavement management plan, once we have that in place, which is a plan that we do pretty much every five to eight years to make sure that we take a look at all the paved roads, see what they're uh, lifespan is, and then uh, we look at the prioritization based on need and traffic. Um, then we can come up with a five-year CIP uh, and make sure that we have money saved uh, in order to pay for those costs. And I do believe that Main Street we did in 2012, 2013, and I think the lifespan will be probably be coming up in 2026, 2027. Uh, so that'll be something we have to make sure that we put money away for to uh, fully fund. Uh, central uh, put a water phase. Uh, town council approved that back in April. Um, hopefully, you know we'll spend the 3.081 million by next fiscal year. The Chase and Main intersection improvements. I'm still waiting for the mayor to, or the governor to sign the uh, the budget. Once he signs the budget, then we'll be able to go ahead and allocate those funds for 3.25. Uh, Windermere Road and Main Street. Again, we had those monies and we already started the uh, design on that. And then North Potable Water Phase. Um, where we awarded the $2.396 million for uh, this fiscal year. Um, still waiting on the uh, governor's on the budget, but over the last uh, three years, I mean, it's a testament to, um, you know, staff and uh, working with our consultants and our engineers to make sure that we try to get as many grant opportunities or appropriations, but um, we've taken in probably about $14.602 million uh, and grants and appropriations. So I really want to thank not only council, but also the staff uh, for working hard and also our, our other elected officials on helping us get that money. So with that said, Mayor, I'll open it up for any questions. 
I appreciate it and thanks uh, to staff and everybody for working to, to get those appropriations that allow us to leverage our funds and, and to keep our military where it is and, and still get these uh, projects finished and, and through the, you know, and, and out there making things better for all of the residents. Um, any questions for Robert on the uh, FY24 or what is it, 23, 20, 24, 25 is the next one. So 23, 24 right now. Yes, sir. All right. I do see um, uh, Councilperson David has his hand up. Councilperson David, you have the floor. Yeah, Robert, just a real quick question, and it may be premature. When will we um, understand what the uh, payback for the uh, uh, Healthy West Orange grant is going to be? I had the meeting with their attorney, um, I would say a month ago. And um, I mean, I hate to say it, but the response was, you know, well, you're going to be uh, talking to a separate attorney. Um, and I was like, OK, but, you know, the invoices are the invoices. Um, so what Rotor Inc. has paid out to Healthy West Orange is at around one hundred thousand um, dollars. And we've looked over the invoices and I did that with John Fitzgibbon and also with um Molly Rose, um, we looked at every invoice and we validated each one. Um, and we were only agreeable to paying out what was invoiced up until the time that um, the town went ahead and, uh, you know, stopped proceeding with the pavilion. And when Healthy West Orange went ahead and revoked um, or took away the, uh, uh, the monies. Now, when I had discussions with Healthy, with Healthy West Orange, um, they were only out $100,000 out of the original $1 million that was allocated for that project. Um, so it, they're, the only one thing that I, you know, I wouldn't pay for, I think they paid about $1,500 for uh, groundbreaking shirts and also for um, um, dedication shirts. And that was really premature and I would not agree to that. Um, but everything else we agreed to that it was work that was um, all the way up until the point that, you know, the, the project was stopped. Um, we do have outstanding invoices from um, McCree um, and maybe Hunter Brady. Um, but again, those invoices haven't been paid by Rotary Inc. And also, um, a lot of those are for lost profits, which um, I don't believe the town is in a position to pay for. So my conversation was with them was, you know, this is what I believe town council is willing to pay for. Um, and I need an answer of, you know, are you ready for us to cut a check or what's going on? And it's been in limbo since that point. I've talked to um, the attorney for Rotary Inc., and I've talked to um, uh, Byron Sutton um, and nothing to this point. But, you know, the one thing we negotiated, I think it was like maybe 97500 that the town would be willing to pay back. But again, I would need town council approval for that. Okay, thank you. I guess uh, we'll, we'll need to readdress this whenever you get a response. Yes, sir. I mean, it's better to be in our bank account than, um, you know, just waiting on their response to figure out which avenue they want to take um, and then go from there. Okay. Is there is there a possibility, Robert, that we could share some of the requests and responses uh, with council? Uh, from um, their attorney and from Byron? Please. Yes, sir. The conversations with uh, their attorney was verbal and same thing with Byron, but anything that I can uh, send you, I will. It's public record. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Council, any additional questions? Anything from staff edition? All right. Seeing none, we will go ahead and uh, adjourn our uh, Town of Windermere uh, workshop at 8.12 p.m. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you. Good evening. Thank Thanks you, Mayor. Talk Talk you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night, everyone. Have a good night.